Only a week ago, I discussed the fact that Russian manpower shortages were becoming a critical impediment to their operations in Ukraine. For seven months, the Russian military has been fighting a war in Ukraine while insisting it is not actually at war. The special military operation, as they called it, meant no conscripts. It meant no reservists. Instead, it meant deep attrition on the active duty forces, the cannibalization of training units, and a growing problem with soldiers who refused to serve or refused to re-enlist at the end of their contract service periods. I essentially argued that Russia would have to implement either mobilization or stop loss or some measure like that, or inevitably the build-up of Ukrainian manpower would pose a significant challenge for them in any battles going forward. After seven months of half measures, Vladimir Putin would make a speech on September 21st announcing a partial mobilization. Now, Putin didn't declare war on Ukraine. This continues to be a special military operation, as the Russians call it. And yet, for the first time since the Second World War, Russian reservists and former military servicemen would be drafted back into the army and sent off to war. Putin's speech would be followed by another by Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu, who announced that 300,000 would be called up. And in the frenzy of media discussion that followed, it was impossible to find a consensus on exactly what this announcement meant. Opinions ranged from those who argued that this was the Russian steamroller finally getting up to speed to crush Ukraine once and for all, to those who argued that this was a recipe for disaster which would spell the end of the Russian Federation and produce basically nothing of military value. Now, with the benefit of about a week to reflect and gather evidence, I thought I'd take a shot at that particular question. To that end, I'm first going to be covering some context. I'm going to ask why mobilization became necessary, why Russia was essentially out of options. Secondly, I'm going to have a little bit of a look at Russia's military reserves and their employment because it's a little bit confusing for Western audiences. And then I'm going to ask an important question. What has Russia said they're doing so far as mobilization goes? And what have they actually done? In particular, I want to cover two very, very important elements of their initiatives that aren't actually the mobilization itself their implementation of what is basically stop loss, and the role of the referenda on four oblasts of Ukraine joining the Russian Federation. Then I'm going to look at the Russian mobilization process itself. How is it going? What evidence have we been able to discover? What sort of problems is it facing in terms of training and equipment? And I'm also going to look at the public response in Russia. Then finally, I'm going to look at the military impact or likely military impact of the mobilization process. What sort of combat power is it likely to generate? and what might it mean for the conduct of the war going forward. But before we jump into it, a word from a sponsor. Now today's returning sponsor is Blinkist, a service which offers summaries of more than 5,000 books and podcasts, including some recent bestsellers. Now unlike me, Blinkist has the ability to convey key ideas in 15 to 20 minutes. And if you have the kind of dodgy internet that Australians know and love, it offers you the chance to download those summaries to consume offline at your leisure. Now I've talked about my experience with Blinkist before, Last time I talked about The Art of War by Sun Tzu. But Blinkist is good for more than just sources of ancient wisdom, because Blinkist has a summary of von Clausewitz's On War. The war in Ukraine has reintroduced military theory and lexicon into public discourse in a big way. If you've listened to this channel for a while, you would have heard me using some of the terms. Fog of war, friction, culminating point, center of gravity. We use these terms to help understand all the complexities of modern war, but one of their best explorations and explanations dates back to the 19th century, the work of Prussian commander Karl von Clausewitz in his work Von Krieg. It's a work that continues to be taught in military academies around the world to this day. And if you're interested in understanding why, well, Blinkist has a 20 minute summary. And since Blinkist now has the Blinkist Connect feature, which allows premium users to share their content with any one other user at no extra cost, well, if you have a relative or friend who needs some Prussian military theory in their life, they're now going to have no excuse. Now, Blinkist does have a special offer. If you click the link in the description down below, it'll give you access to a seven-day free trial and then a 25% discount on a premium membership. So if you're interested, check it out. Why, after seven months of trying everything else, including recruiting prisoners and offering exorbitant sums of money to ethnic minorities in order to fight in Ukraine, did Putin finally turn and hit the mobilization button? After all, given his reluctance to date, you have to imagine the need would be fairly dire for him to change course. Especially given that as recently as about three weeks ago, Dmitry Peskov, the press secretary for the Kremlin, was out there telling the Russian people that there were no plans for a mobilization. But the reality was that at the big picture, in terms of the big strategic inputs into a nation's fighting power, manpower, material, method, morale, intelligence, ideas that I've talked about before, 
manpower was rapidly becoming Russia's Achilles heel in Ukraine. Russia actually began the Ukraine war with a manpower advantage over its opponent. The Russian army ground forces were larger than the Ukrainian equivalents, the Russian airborne forces larger than the Ukrainian equivalents, and Russia had the Donbass proxies who rapidly mobilised to rely on as well. But after the war began, the two nations took diametrically different approaches. Ukraine hit the general mobilisation button on day one. They banned men of military fighting age from leaving the country and have spent the last seven months as aggressively expanding the number of troops in their army as possible. Russia, meanwhile, seems to have tried to keep the war away from the Russian people themselves. They conscripted people in the, the Donbass regions, in the so-called DPR and LPR, but in Russia itself it was a game of recruiting conscripts or paying exorbitant sums to volunteers or paramilitary groups or mercenaries in order to try and make up numbers. And so, despite the vast population difference between Ukraine and Russia, commentators would note pretty early on that things were going to trend in terms of Ukraine as the war went on. Pro-Russian commentators on the ground started sounding the alarm as early as April or May, once it was apparent that Kyiv wouldn't fall, that Ukrainian general mobilisation ran the genuine risk of swamping Russian manpower if the Russian Federation didn't carry out at least a partial mobilisation. But no mobilisation would be forthcoming. On the internet, the most popular rebuttal to the idea that Russia would experience manpower shortages was the sheer size of the Russian military. This is where the idea that Russia was only using 20% of its military came from. Now, I talked about this from the earliest days, the fact that a lot of the Russian military was made up of units that weren't suitable for ground combat in Ukraine. The Navy, the strategic missile forces, conscripts which couldn't be deployed overseas in times of peace, such as during a special military operation, for example. And that the majority of the combat-capable ground formations of the Russian army have been used in Ukraine and have been used extensively. What has become clearer in recent weeks and months, though, is that even these non-ground combat units have been taxed in order to provide reinforcements for Ukraine. We've got cases of members of Russia's strategic missile forces being captured after fighting as part of tank units in Ukraine. The strategic rocket forces are the units which control Russia's strategic deterrent arsenal, intercontinental ballistic missiles equipped with nuclear weapons. Now, before you over-exaggerate the implications of this, the soldiers that I saw interviewed who had become POWs claimed that they weren't actually missileers. They were instead part of the security detachment which protected the launch sites for the atomic weapons. So Russia's not quite at the point yet where they're drafting the missile launch crews themselves to go fight as part of tank units in Ukraine. They're just drafting the people whose job it is to protect those nuclear weapons from, you know, terrorists. So sleep well at night. Likewise, we have obituary evidence that Russia is taxing its officer corps to the absolute limits. Uh, Rob Lee on Twitter identified an obituary of a Russian senior lieutenant who was killed while commanding a battalion in Ukraine. For those who aren't in the military, lieutenants don't normally command battalions. In another case that I saw evidence of, sailors of the Baltic fleet were captured after their tank was destroyed. You heard that right. Sailors who were captured after their tank was destroyed. And time and time again, we find evidence of Russian manpower and units being stretched beyond breaking point. We know, for example, 1st Guards Tank Army took significant damage early in the war. The Battle of Trostyanets is an example. But the unit wasn't pulled out of Ukraine and comprehensively rebuilt. Instead, it was stationed at Izium, somewhere where it fought continuously, held its positions until it was eventually smacked around by the Kharkiv counteroffensive. The question is why? And I suspect, and only suspect, that the reason is the same reason that we see instructors from Russia's military academies surfacing in KIAs and obituary reports in Ukraine. It's the same reason we see junior officers leading larger units. It's the same reason we see sailors and members of the strategic rocket forces surfacing in tank divisions. It's because Russia was straining every available source it could in order to generate combat power. And I think it's reasonable to infer that by the point that you're stripping down your nuclear missile forces in order to make up frontline combat strength, you're probably pretty desperate. And so the natural next question to ask is, why? Why were things becoming so dire from a manpower perspective? And I'd suggest there are four key drivers. So let's talk about what they did. Cause one is perhaps the most obvious, casualties and attrition. Now, in his speech, Sergei Shoigu admitted to 5,937 Russian KIA in Ukraine since the February 24 invasion began. Now, I do find that figure interesting because the BBC, for example, has found 
more than 6,000 obituaries for Russian servicemen killed in Ukraine since February 24th, which means either Sergei Shoigu is lying or some Russian mothers are faking the deaths of their sons in Ukraine. In any case, Western casualty estimates for Russian forces are far higher. The US estimate in early August was 70 to 80,000 Russian and Russian allied casualties. Ukraine claims 57,000 enemy KIA since February 24th. Most identified Russian BTGs and formations are well below their established strength. The DPR and LPR forces are described by their own pro-Russian commentators and commanders as essentially depleted. Around Bakhmut and Piski, where the fighting was heaviest in favour of the Russians, there was a visible reliance on groups like Wagner to make up infantry numbers. And in terms of the offensive in Kharkiv, you have to imagine that if the force wasn't largely bled out, you wouldn't have a situation where large segments of fronts were held by little more than a couple of DPR-LPR mobilised personnel hardened by a number of Roskvadia units. Given the fighting has only been ongoing for seven months, these are serious casualty numbers. And then there's the issue of troops resigning or finishing their contracts rather than waiting to be killed or wounded. Because Russia regards this as a special military operation, not a war, it's only been able to rely on the professional elements of its military to do most of the fighting, the contract soldiers, the kontraktniki. Now, in some ways, that's a very attractive concept because few in society are going to object to you sending volunteers as opposed to you sending conscripts. However, given you're not at war, it also has a number of drawbacks. For one thing, there are circumstances in which Kontraktniki can simply refuse to deploy to Ukraine. This has become a serious problem. You see situations where Russian units are putting photographs of servicemen who refuse to deploy above urinals and exploiting as much social pressure as they can. But at the end of the day, it's hard to force a contract soldier to go to war in Ukraine when there's no state of mobilisation and no declaration of war. They can also resign, break their contracts, because again, they're not at war. And even if they can't resign or break their contracts, eventually those contracts run out. Most Russian contract service personnel sign a three-year contract. The war is now been going for seven months, which means you, if you assume an even distribution, and yes, I know that many will sign longer contracts if they're professional officers, for example, you'd see about 20% of contracts expiring during those seven months. Now, obviously, we've seen cases of Russian soldiers complain their contracts have been involuntarily extended for a month or so on a local basis. But those situations do generate complaints through the Russian legal system. They're notable, even if in the end the Russian system can choose to ignore them. You can try and patch the system by extending contracts here and there, but you also have to imagine you can't avoid this problem forever. And at the same time, how many people are really signing up for regular contract service in the Russian army at the moment? Meanwhile, if you look at the, the volunteer in inverted commas units, both those that are raised by the regional government, so the volunteer tank battalions, the units that went to 3rd Army Corps, they were offered extremely high salaries in order to sign six-month contracts. They would get a signing bonus, they would get a mustering out bonus, and a large monthly pay while they were there, and after six months they would be done. The prisoners that were going into Wagner Group, they were offered six months of service, and after that they would be free. And so, if this war continued to drag on... More contract soldiers' contracts would elapse, and all those volunteers who'd been raised for six months would suddenly be free to go. And it's highly unlikely that recruitment was going to be able to make up for all the contracts that were lapsing and for the troops that were being killed or wounded in Ukraine. There's significant evidence that recruitment in Russia has struggled to compensate for manpower outflows since the invasion began. Third Army Corps, for example, which brought together a lot of those volunteer units that had been raised by local governments, was observed to be significantly below or suspected to be significantly below its intended strength. After the disaster at Kharkiv, Kadyrov's suggestion for the Russian government to address the problem was to call for a self-mobilization of Russia's regions, wherein every region would have to raise 1,000 troops, which would yield about 85,000 replacements. Now, that sounds like a grand proposal. Basically, the early volunteer plan that had been used earlier, but on a larger scale. But in the grand scheme of things, 85,000 new recruits was only going to be enough for a patch job, even if it succeeded. If you use the Western casualty estimates, for example, even if Kadyrov's plan worked, it was about enough to cover the casualties that had been suffered to date, not to build up additional combat power or compensate for the fact that Ukraine was several waves into its general mobilisation. And again, I'd ask the question of whether or not these were truly additional troops that were being raised. They were being attracted. When you talk about volunteers that went into 3AC, for example, these are the volunteers that were being offered 10 times the normal salary rate in many cases. 
in a circumstance where you can get a massive amount of cash for signing up on a short-term contract, how many troops do we really think were signing up for regular contract service at a fraction of the rate on a three-year contract in the middle of a war? My suggestion would be that if Russian efforts to raise troops with these very heavy incentives were falling well short of their recruitment goals, then the regular contract recruitment which Russia relies on to sustain the strength of its contract force was probably also in deep deficits. Of course, we don't have firm stats from the Russians on that point. My point is simply, if someone offers you a job for 160,000 rubles a month, are you really most of the time going to say no, turn around and take exactly the same job from someone else for 30 or 40,000 rubles a month? Now, there are circumstances where you might, but in most cases, no, you're going to go for the money. And the fourth problem was simply that Russia couldn't legally deploy a lot of the manpower that it technically had available. This is really two separate problems. The first is that conscripts, because this wasn't wartime, couldn't be used in operations outside of Russia. And until the recent referenda went through and the subsequent annexation gets voted on whenever it gets voted on, the occupied regions of Ukraine are not seen even in Russia as part of Russia. The second problem among contract personnel, be they in the military or in units like Roskvaria, was simply personnel refusing to go. And for much of the war, while these personnel could be intimidated, threatened, browbeaten or bribed, there were very few legal mechanisms to actually force them to deploy if they were currently in Russia and refused to deploy to Ukraine. Taken together, these problems denied Russia access to literally hundreds of thousands of personnel when it came to considering deployments into Ukraine. Most of those, obviously, being conscripts that were on their single-year service terms. And for those of you who are interested, I previously covered why that was a particular problem for the infantry strength of Russian units that ended up deploying with their contract personnel, but without their conscripts. I would argue that all of these factors come together to create a sort of self-perpetuating cycle that was putting pressure on Russian manpower. First, the army would suffer combat casualties in Ukraine. Those casualties and news of the war perhaps not going well would motivate refuseniks or resignations or lower recruitment numbers. Those resignations and recruitment difficulties coupled with the inability to deploy conscripts meant that there was a shortage of combat power, infantry strength. That lack of combat power would then drive casualties and those casualties would drive recruitment difficulties and refusals of personnel to deploy. In other words, the harder things got, the less likely people would be to step up and take their chance. And the fewer people stood up, well, the worse things would get. Faced with those compounding downward pressures on the available manpower, perhaps it really shouldn't be surprising that Russia felt it had to do something, anything, in order to arrest the decline. And when looking at the Russian mobilisation, it's important to look not just at what was said, but what was actually done. It may shock you to hear this, but there were some discrepancies between what the Russian political leadership, Vladimir Putin and Sergei Shoigu, said would happen in relation to mobilization and what appears to actually be happening. The first thing to point out is that Russia was clearly preparing or setting the ground for a potential mobilization well before a mobilization was actually called. Even while Peskov was out there saying that there was no intention to mobilize, we saw lots of evidence that they were at least getting ready for the possibility. Draft officers were calling individuals in for refresher training. Russia has the right to call people up for limited refresher training, or they were asking people to just come into the mobilization center and update their details, update their draft details. So if the government needed to contact anyone in an emergency, say for an extremely unlikely mobilization, then the details would be up to date and on record. And while the army tried to dust the cobwebs off its old mobilization infrastructure that had pretty much decayed entirely since the days of the Soviet Union, the Duma was putting in place the legal frameworks for this sort of mobilization, one that existed outside the context of a declared war. The legal changes introduced very heavy criminal penalties for a range of offenses for refusing to participate in hostilities, for desertion, or for reservists who were called up and refused to turn up for training. And now these penalties would apply not just during armed conflict, but also during a period of, quote, mobilization. It basically put in place the legal structure to apply wartime standards of discipline and punishment to soldiers and reservists, not just during a war, but just a mobilization. Say, for example, during a military operation that was not a war, but was somehow special enough to require a mobilization. At the time though, it was still being said that these changes had nothing to do with any impending call for mobilization. 
So, of course, mobilization would be declared shortly afterwards. Vladimir Putin would go on TV saying that he had accepted the military's recommendation that there be a partial mobilization of troops to assist with the special military operation in Ukraine. Shoigu would expand on TV by saying that, yes, this was going to be a limited mobilization of Russian reservists. It was going to be people with military experience and specialties, people in a very tight age range. There was a range of stated exceptions and protections, and the sort of duties that were going to be assigned to these personnel, they weren't going to be thrown into the meat grinder or frontline combat duties. No, no, no. None of that. This was a limited mobilization a focused call-up of reservists with specialist military skills and qualifications, and that everyone would be properly trained before they deployed. In other words, this wasn't that serious a development, and that there was no need to panic over the potential for being called up. And unfortunately, I think it was these two speeches that served as the basis for a lot of the media coverage we got in the 48 hours or so following Vladimir Putin's announcement. The idea that Russia was conducting a limited call-up of 300,000 specially trained reservists who would be deployed to Ukraine. Of course, all lawyers know that you don't listen to the politician's speech, you read the text of the law they passed. And Vladimir Putin's mobilization decree, the actual text, it's relatively short, I'll throw it up on screen, basically bore very little resemblance to the speeches that we were given. For one thing, the word limited never appeared in the document. There were no restrictions on what combat duties any people mobilized would fill, Exceptions were basically in the document limited to those who worked in the defence industry, who were completely medically unfit to serve, who were far too old, or had received a prison sentence, which I find ironic given Wagner's practice of recruiting from prisons. And even more worryingly for many Russians, the decree actually contained a classified section, Section 7. Originally when asked about this, Peskov refused to comment, didn't want to talk about it. Eventually, he would say that Section 7 contained classified instructions on how many people were to be called up. Now, of course, Russians immediately started asking the question, well, if the number of people to be called up is 300,000, as Sergei Shoigu has just said on TV, then why classify the section? So immediately, of course, Russian opposition figures start suggesting that secretly the real number is much higher, as high as a million. And I have no ability or insight to offer you to answer that question. All I'll point out is that none of these protections or clarifications that were being made that would make this mobilization limited were actually contained in the legal documents that authorized and ordered that mobilization. So of course, the next natural question to ask is if those protections weren't in the document, did the Russian military machine honor those promises anyway? Did mobilization look like a limited, controlled, narrow affair? Yeah, no, nah, there's plenty of evidence that they're calling up people in their 40s and 50s and issuing them decrepit equipment and zero training and then deploying them to combat areas. But we'll get to that in a minute. Before we do, I want to talk about the other things that they did at the time that had nothing to do with the mobilization of reservists themselves that are in many ways more important. Because we shouldn't view Russian mobilization in a vacuum. It wasn't just about calling people up for service. It was about two other equally important measures that also address manpower problems. The first was the announcement that those with contracts, be they in volunteer units or the contract Russian military, should expect to have their contracts extended involuntarily for the duration of the mobilization. This was basically stop-loss, Russian style, for those Americans in the audience. In other words, if you had signed a six-month contract five months ago on the promise of enough money to buy a fancy new car when you got out of service, congratulations, you're in for the duration. If you're a prisoner who signed on six months and then he gets his freedom and gets a chance to walk away, congratulations, they're altering the terms of the agreement, you're in for the duration. And if you're a contract soldier, a week away from retirement, congratulations, you're in for the duration. No more refusal to deploy, no more retiring, no more stepping away from the front. This move is less about regenerating Russian forces as it is about stopping the manpower bleeding. Calling up 300,000 mobilized personnel would do little if all the volunteers and veterans that you had melted away in the coming months and years. Assessing the impact of this policy is very difficult in terms of prediction. In terms of manpower numbers, it's, it's fairly predictable. It prevents that cliff that Russia was facing with troops finishing their six-month volunteer deals or contracts mustering out of their contract service. But in terms of morale, things are somewhat questionable. You have to imagine a lot of troops were just holding on for the end of their contract. Now there's no end in sight. American personnel in the comments can attest to how much stop loss sucked and how much it did in order to demotivate forces that were deployed overseas. So while it's hard to know exactly how much impact this change will have on Russian morale, 
It should be non-negligible, but it does stop the bleeding. That said, you now have to wonder how many voluntary recruits the army is going to be getting if they know they may be stuck involuntarily in for the duration of an entire war. The second point is in connection to the so-called referenda, which as at time of recording have just voted, according to Russia, by overwhelming majority to join the Russian Federation. I wonder if that's because the voting was potentially fraudulent or at gunpoint, or if a lot of the population had been evicted. Who knows? And even though basically the entire world, including countries that are very friendly to Russia, like Serbia for example, have called out these referenda for the legal sham that they are, it appears to be at time of recording that we are only days away from Russia formally incorporating these regions into the Russian Federation. Now, a lot of discussion on this point focuses on the potential nuclear implications, the idea that this will mean that Ukraine is now attacking Russian territory and as a result, Russia will respond with nuclear force. Well, Ukraine has attacked Crimea, which the Russians claim is Russian territory. There have been attacks on Belgorod, which everyone recognizes as Russian territory, and it hasn't exactly brought the sky crashing down or a second sunrise over Kyiv. More significant and more easily quantified, I think, is the fact that once these territories are Russian, well in go the conscripts. If Donetsk and Lugansk and Kherson and Zaporizhia are defined as part of Russia, then the Russian conscript troops that Russia has not been able to deploy for combat operations in those areas, well, now there is a legal grounds to deploy them there because they're undertaking operations, quote, inside Russia. The Russian military was never designed, its units were never intended to fight a high intensity war without being able to use their conscript personnel. It's hamstrung them from the beginning. And so I would suspect that if the legal status of these territories changes, at least in the view of the Russian government, not in the view of the rest of the world, then they will use that as a legal justification to untie their hands and reunite their conscripts with their combat units. Although there may still be political sensitivities around them doing so. They're leaving their options open by doing this. They may hesitate for a while, but if the pressure becomes too great, well, I expect the conscripts to start leaking in. Maybe not immediately, but probably eventually. For my part, I'm wondering if this means that Poland, the Baltic states and Germany are going to get together and organise a referendum in their territory on whether or not Kaliningrad should, you know, pass out of Russian hands. Because, you know, if you don't actually have to control the entire territory in order to have a referendum on joining a different country, well, the opportunities are truly endless. But then, of course, there is the question of the mobilisation itself. Beyond stop loss, beyond the redefinition of what Russia is in order to potentially allow the deployment of conscripts, there is the overarching question of the mobilisation, the calling up of reservists in order to make up numbers. And here I think a quick clarification is important before we get into the meat of what is happening. When Western observers and audiences hear that Russia is calling up reservists, we think of the National Guard. We think of the US Army Reserve. We think of reserve forces in the French military or the British military or the German military. That's not how it works in Russia, and that's not who's being called up. Now, Russia does have a rough equivalent to something like the US Army Reserve. It's the Special Combat Army Reserve, known by its acronym BARS. These are troops who are voluntarily in the reserve who do do refresher training. They're already mobilized. They were called up in April and they have been fighting in Ukraine for months. So this mobilization isn't about them. No, when Shoigu says that he has 20 plus million Russian reservists available, he's talking about the entire pool of Russians with at least some military experience, which is an awful lot of them considering that Russia and the Soviet Union use conscription. When you talk about this wider population of potential, in inverted commas, reservists, you're not talking about people who do large-scale and regular refresher training. These are people who may not have held a gun for years. Now, there is some hypothetical liability for refresher training for people in this category, but it's relatively limited, and there are questions over how often troops are actually called up for it. And given what we know about the effect of corruption on the regular contract Russian military and how it undermined their exercises, I think we have reason to question the extent to which Russian former conscripts or people in this reserve category were really being exercised properly with any degree of regularity. So if the people Russia is planning to call up aren't highly trained volunteer active reservists, who are they? So far as the evidence available to us goes, it's not exactly the narrow group of people with niche combat skills in proper age brackets described by Peskov or Shoigu. I've thrown up some images there on the right-hand side of the slide. There are dozens more available. 
Now, either that means that the mobilisation process is discarding the target age limits to get people in their 20s and 30s, or those are the oldest looking 20-somethings I have ever seen. But you might ask, maybe these are serious combat veterans. I mean, some of these guys look old enough to have served in Afghanistan. Maybe they're being recalled for their combat experience. Well, anecdotally, we have evidence that really isn't being adhered to either. Many of the people being called up, their families are reporting that they had no combat experience. In some cases, they had no military experience. Something that is possible if you manage to avoid or permanently defer being drafted. I've got one example there quoted by Rob Lee on Twitter. 51-year-old in Volgograd who was mobilized even though he had no military experience, was deaf in one ear, had poor eyesight and herniated discs. He was sent to training without a medical examination. Now, once this came out and was popularized in the media, the guy was sent home, but you can see the problem. Health standards seem to be being ignored in many cases by local authorities that are keen to make up numbers. I'd also call out the fact that there seems to be a great discrepancy by geography. Once again, it seems to be Russia's ethnic minority or economically depressed regions that are feeling the pinch of mobilization the hardest. Some of the articles I've seen quote that in one village in the Zakaminsky region of Buryatia, 20 out of 450 residents were mobilized. If you mobilized people at that ratio across the Russian Federation, you'd end up with a mobilization call up of something like 6 million people. And the list of people who seem to be there just to make quota goes on. There are anecdotes of plenty. People who were fathers of five with no military experience in their late 30s, men in their 40s being drafted in Yakutia. You even have Russia Today columnists, propagandists, talking about stories of men who weigh more than 300 pounds, who are in their late 40s or early 50s, or who clearly aren't medically fit being drafted. Protesters against the war. Drafted. And I'd like to point out that in particular isn't a new Russian initiative. The Russian Empire liked to draft people who protested against the government and send them to frontline units. Historically, that turned out to be a bit of a problem. When they arrested hardcore communists, sent them to the front lines, surprise, surprise, those people would later become agitators and start causing discipline problems in the frontline units. It's actually a bad idea to take dissidents, give them guns and put them in military units and then give them a lot of other young people with guns to listen to their ideas. Just a thought. But the core point here is those guarantees around age, military expertise, and health conditions don't seem to be respected in practice so far from the evidence that we can see. Now, I mean no disrespect to the older people in my audience. But if, for example, you are in your late 50s, you are overweight, you are half blind, you have poor hearing in your left ear, you have a myriad of health issues and you have never served in the military, then things have to be pretty dire before it is a good idea for a government to put you into an infantry unit. But hey, even if the draftees would be medically unfit in any other army in the world, maybe they are receiving the best training that Mother Russia can provide. After all, it was promised that they would receive significant refresher training before being deployed to largely safe roles. Now, Will it shock you all to hear that in many cases that doesn't actually seem to be happening? We've got fairly extensive evidence that in many cases that training that was promised is either not happening, is being severely truncated, or is of dubious quality. I've got an image in the bottom right there of some excellent firearm safety that was taken from a video. And you might think, oh, those guys are under-equipped and the training's not great. Maybe it's an isolated incident. That is taken from a video of a training unit that Sergei Shoigu visited and they decided to then publish on Russian TV. If that is the training they choose to show on TV as a propaganda piece, I dread to imagine what other training situations look like. Well, we don't have to guess because in some cases we've got pro-Russian commentators who are compiling stories and reports from those who have been mobilised that call out incidents like this one. For four days now, the mobilized men have wandered around the training ground as if they are restless. There is no studying. No one really understands anything. No one has seen officers of the battalion commander level and above. And we can't even say those are just people who are griping because in some cases we have local military officials saying that, well, we don't actually intend to give refresher courses to people below a certain age because they should remember all the lessons they learnt during their conscript service. Now, I'm sure there are those that might choose to actually make that argument that maybe recent conscripts will retain basic infantry skills from their time in the military, even if they've been out for, say, five or six years, and they can probably do without a refresher course. But the point is that a refresher course was promised and is now not being delivered. 
Also interesting is who we can see evidence of doing the training in the cases that we can see training being done. Observers that compile a lot of the open source intelligence around this observe that we're seeing instructors from Russia's higher military academies, for example, often being used to coordinate or contribute to the training of mobilized reservists, which is a little strange to say the least. Those people should be off training, for example, officer cadets. But then again, who else would be doing the training? Russian conscripts usually receive most of their training with their combat units, but in most cases, the combat units are in Ukraine. The training battalions that normally handle the training have in many cases been reportedly cannibalized in order to generate more combat personnel and have been fighting in Ukraine for months. We've talked about Russia cannibalizing its training units. So now who's gonna train the various mobilized reservists who have to come along and try and fill the gaps? And I thought it might be valuable to make this real for a moment, to get this down to the level of individual stories and anecdotes. It's critical to remember here, the plural of anecdotes is not evidence. So I'm not presenting anecdotal cases as part of a compelling evidential picture, more just to make this entire experience human and to give an ex illustration of what this might look like. So for example, in the top right there, we have one case of a Russian mobilized soldier who's reporting that he's been told that he's not gonna get any training. Instead, he's going to Kherson in two days with the 1st Tank Regiment, which probably means he's attaching to sit to what is left of 2nd Guards Motor Rifle Division fighting in Kherson. In another case that I've got down below, recruits at a training base, which is again associated with 2nd Guards Motor Rifle Division, report that they're sleeping on the floor for the third day in a row. They're not receiving training. They're just sitting around. And now they're being told that they're gonna depart for Donetsk in three days. One imagines there must be a degree of hopelessness for men who turn up for mobilization, get told that no training will actually be taking place and that they're heading to the front in a couple of days. Enjoy sleeping on the floor in the meantime. I wanna stress this isn't a uniquely Russian problem. The Russian mobilization system clearly wasn't configured this and there's clearly a shortage or there's evidence to suggest a shortage of trainers, especially if some of those have been moved to combat units. But Ukraine suffered difficulties in this area as well. The Ukrainian mobilization system wasn't configured to absorb as many volunteers as they had or to mobilize the army as quick as they'd like. There was always a demand for trainers and experienced troops to be at the front rather than in the rear areas training troops. Of course, Ukraine had a number of advantages that could offset this problem. Foreign support, a large body of combat veterans who had at least at some point fought in the Donbass over the last several years, and the fact that by now they've had seven months to get it right. Russia's pretty late to the party. And if you think the training picture isn't up to snuff, let's talk about kit. Now again, I'd stress the importance of not over-extrapolating what a mobilization of hundreds of thousands of people looks like based on a couple of videos and a couple of images that are starting to get out. But nothing says that you are a military superpower like issuing people with rifles and personal equipment that is literally caked with rust even inside the action itself. We have videos of men complaining when issued equipment that is in a god awful state after coming out of storage that, hey, they don't need personal weapons, they're gonna be a tank unit, so why are you complaining? Well, they're complaining because their AKs are so rusted that they physically can't cycle the things. Those rifles can probably be restored. With a lot of effort, the right cleaning kit and the right know-how, you can probably get that thing functional, although I wouldn't wanna be the one shooting it. And beyond just decrepit stuff, we're seeing increasing densities of older materials start to pop up. Older and older tanks, older and older APCs, older and older personal firearms. Now these issues may not be universal. In fact, I'd go so far as to suggest they're probably not universal, but it's gonna complicate Russian mobilization efforts to isolate which depots have not stored their equipment correctly, where has stuff been sold off or disappeared, where are there shortages, how are you gonna reissue equipment, how are you gonna handle force generation in this environment. It's gonna take a while to get it all sorted out. And in the meantime, it's gonna be pretty terrible for morale when videos get out there and Russians see that their soldiers are being issued with this crap. And that's if they're being issued with anything in the first place. We've got extensive video evidence, photographic evidence, commentary from pro-Russian commentators on the internet that are saying that recruits are being told, for example, there aren't enough medical supplies to get around. So they should approach relatives to send them pads and tampons to deal with bullet wounds, loot first, first aid kits from cars in order to find tourniquets. In some cases that they should get sleeping bags and sleeping pads so they can survive in the environment, that they should purchase winter clothing, 
or that they should go out and buy their own armor because the army won't be issuing any. And let's just say Private Conscriptovich has parents who are rich enough to buy him body armor, tourniquets, medications, anti-diarrheals, preemptive antibiotics, a first aid kit, a sleeping bag, a sleeping mat, but aren't rich enough to bribe his way out of mobilization. Well, we've got comments from pro-Russian commentators saying that in some cases conscripts are arriving and having all their stuff confiscated and taken away from them anyway. Now, whether that's so it can be more evenly issued throughout the unit or whether it's so the supply officers can sell it, you be the judge. But if you have shortages of such basal personal equipment, medical kit, personal firearms, sleeping bags and winter clothing, what are the odds these units are going to be issued with the real force multipliers that we've seen in short supply in Ukraine? Encrypted comms, drones, those sort of force multipliers that are so essential for survival and combat effectiveness on the Ukrainian battlefield. I'd also note again that at the start of the war, Ukraine faced a lot of these issues. Some Ukrainian TDF units still face these sort of issues. There weren't enough guns, there weren't enough medical kits, there weren't enough vehicles or drones to go around. The difference again is that Ukraine has had seven months of foreign support pumping in drones, winter clothing, all the panoply of war, millions upon millions of rounds of small arm ammunition and firearms. And they've got pretty well-established fundraising avenues and charities, things like Come Back Alive, which gather funds and then purchase equipment that units need for them. Russia is facing the same difficulties without seven months of building up the infrastructure to respond to them and without foreign backers with a lot of money in deep stockpiles willing to send them equipment to help make up the difference. And I will admit all of this seems relatively confronting. The idea that a major military power could undergo a relatively restrained in terms of scope military call-up and yet still be reduced to issuing rusted firearms, limited training to people who are overage, overweight, medically disqualified, and then telling recruits to bring their own stuff and then stealing the stuff from the recruits when they turn up with it. That's a pretty dire state of affairs. And it would be reasonable for observers to look at that and go, hey, Perun, I know you're saying you've got evidence, there are some videos, but can we really be confident in concluding this or are we drifting into the realms of propaganda? And to that, I'd simply say this. Major figures in the Russian government are noting these same deficiencies. This is not just an Australian analyst on the internet saying this mobilization has been a massive stuff up. Valentina Matvienko is the head of the Federation Council, the upper house of the Russian parliament. She has gone on record and complained that men who are ineligible under the rules that have been set forward by Putin and Shoigu are absolutely being called up. And that, quote, some of the excesses are absolutely unacceptable and are triggering a sharp reaction in society. Vyacheslav Volodin is the Speaker of the Duma, who also has come out in a number of tweets and complained about the mobilization process and the evidence that we are seeing. And then one of my favorite observations from Margarita Simonyan, who is an editor-in-chief at Russia Today, which is the government-owned media channel in Russia that publishes often in English. Summonses are going to 40-year-olds, she said. They're infuriating people. It's as if they'd been sent by Kiev. In other words, she's saying that the management of the mobilization process, that the questions of who are being called up, the training, the equipment issue, all of that, is so terrible that it's almost as if the officials running the process were deliberately sent by Kyiv to sabotage the process as much as possible and infuriate the Russian people. So yes, I would concede that our evidence is incomplete. We don't have images of all of the equipment that is being issued. We don't have evidence of the age and health of all the men that are being recruited. We don't have evidence on the training that all the units are being provided before they're deployed. But all of the evidence we do have points in the same direction as do comments by officials that are very squarely in the Russian circles of power and influence. There is a general acknowledgement that the mobilization has been a shit show, which is calling up people who they said they wouldn't mobilize, training them badly and issuing them crap equipment. And I could bring up more quotes if necessary. So while we don't have certainty, all of our evidence is pointing in the same direction. And so I would think we can conclude with at least a moderate confidence level that shit's going pretty badly with the whole mobilization thing. And on that note, it's worth looking at how the Russian public has responded. 
because the most obvious response is the massive spike in Russians, particularly young fit men, leaving the country. I'm very skeptical about the leak of so-called FSB data that claimed 250,000 Russians had left the country, but we can account for more than 194,000 that have gone to Finland, Georgia and Kazakhstan alone. Soon after mobilization was announced, one-way tickets out of Russia in many cases rose to thousands of US dollars, or in some cases, more than 10,000 US dollars. That's a lot of money in Russia. There are two reasons this is notable. The first is that young men were one of the key drivers of emigration out of Russia already since 24 February, because young men, particularly unmarried young men, tend to be more mobile across borders and more able to pick up and go. Now, with the added motivation to avoid the draft, I don't expect those lines at the Kazakh or Finnish border to be getting shorter anytime soon. If this goes on and mobilization eventually expands beyond partial mobilization towards a more general one, which I think is very, very likely, you can expect this sort of exodus to continue. Unless, of course, the Russian government brings in border controls, something which I wouldn't rule out, especially if the exodus continues for more than a short period of time. From a Russian legal perspective, there's nothing illegal about going overseas to another country if you haven't yet received your call-up papers in order to avoid being drafted, which is one reason why I expect more of those with the means to do so will do so. Now, of course, the motivations for going overseas and trying to avoid the draft are as many and varied as the people who could be drafted. The motivations aren't always political, at least based on the Russians that I've talked to. It's not always about opposition to the war. Often it's very, very personal. It's concern for life, surely, but also the fact that in some cases, people are worried about the limited military salary, losing their homes, or being incapable of supporting their families. And so they head overseas, take up jobs elsewhere, in order to be able to guarantee they can provide for their families. Certainly the population isn't exactly brimming with eager volunteers. If there were people out there who were eager to volunteer, they would have taken the grossly inflated pay packets that were on offer with the volunteer units six months ago, or as recently as last month. But so far, most Russian men seem content to stay, either because they're confident in their ability to evade the draft, or because they take the view that if their papers come, well then that's their job and they'll go, even if they're not happy about it. A lot of Western media focuses very heavily on the protests that we've seen break out in Russia against mobilization. Generally, I think in a strategic sense, these are probably overblown. We've seen a few thousand people protest and been arrested, but in the grand scheme of things and the scale of the Russian population, that's certainly not regime-threatening yet. There have been some kinetic responses. People have done, you know, the sort of things you do when you're mildly upset, like torch draft officers or walk into a recruitment centre and shoot the recruiting officer. That, that's happened in one case that we've seen. And there is a risk of violence breaking out in places where recruitment is heaviest, places like Dagestan. But generally speaking, most resistance seems to take the form of trying to avoid the draft rather than trying to, you know, bring down the regime. It's people racing for reasons to have exemptions, not people racing to try and knock off Vladimir Putin. And of course, there'll be those in the population who simply take the declaration in their stride. Whether it's because Russians are used to hard times, whether it's because of propaganda, patriotism and nationalism, or just an entrenched psyche of compliance, I expect most of Russian society sit to simply go along with the mobilization decree, looking out for themselves and their families where they can. I don't think there's good evidence to suggest that the mobilization decree poses any imminent danger to the Russian government at all. And if history sets any sort of precedent here, it'll only be once mobilization expands to touch all of Russian society, and importantly when the casualties amongst the conscripted begin to mount, that anger will mount with it. And so if we're reasonably confident that draft riots aren't going to break out and storm the Kremlin tomorrow, it's worth turning back to the military significance of mobilization. What does it mean for the war? Because if you've been on YouTube or watching media over the last week, you've probably seen every take along the spectrum ranging from this is the beginning of the Russian steamroller, Ukraine is done, through to this will make no difference, all the way through to this is the literal end of the Russian Federation, Russia is going to collapse any day now. Now, I will say that predicting the outcomes of Russia's mobilization are difficult, but what I can do is set out a couple of questions that will help determine how effective it is, and then talk about a couple of predictions that we might be able to make. The first question I have is Russia's training pipeline. How many people can it absorb and how quickly can it train them to a reasonable standard if it chooses to train them at all? I've said it before and I'll say it again, Russia is not the Soviet Union. It does not have large partially staffed formations with plenty of reserve officers and training personnel ready to absorb an influx of hundreds of thousands or millions of recruits. There are multiple papers out there, which I will link, which basically set out the argument that the old mobilization system of the Soviet Union is gone. Russia has allowed its mobilization infrastructure to atrophy. 
And that means that even if mobilization had been declared in, say, March or April, the Russian army would have had a limited ability to bring in large numbers of people and teach them rapidly. And I'm not just talking about basic infantrymen. I'm talking about training people in technical skills or training reserve officers who need refreshers as well. And that would have been the case if mobilization was called in April. Now, at the tail end of September, the problems are even greater. Russia relies on its units to provide training to new recruits. There is less reliance on large central schools for new recruits or newly called up personnel. Instead, they're normally sent to their units and the training establishment will provide training there. But here's the problem. All those bloody units are in Ukraine and a lot of the training formations have previously been cannibalized in order to provide more combat formations in Ukraine. So many of them will either be fighting or already have become casualties. At a time where Russia is buckling under Ukrainian offensives because of a shortage of manpower, I struggle to believe that they'll be able to pull back sufficient manpower to re-establish some sort of training capability. And so, once again, we've got situations where Russia is using halfway measures or improvisation. We've got images, for example, of a training base that Sergei Shoigu visited and a number of other places where we've got evidence that Russia is using instructors from its higher military academies in order to oversee the training of recently inducted mobilized personnel. Major General Binyakov there should be overseeing a command school for officers, not a place which is teaching recruits which way to point their AK, which perhaps helps explain the stunning lack of gun safety that we saw earlier in this presentation. If these instructors are being used here or in combat, who's at the officer training schools? Who's at the command school? Who is making sure that there is a pipeline of officers coming through still? Or alternately, we have evidence that Russia simply solves the training problem by bypassing the training. If you don't have enough trainers, just don't train the recruits. Easy. The problem there is that the sort of personnel you generate are far less useful. There's some accounts from Alexander Khodorkovsky, who's associated with the DPR-LPR. He's a commander of one of their units. I've talked about him before. Who talks about recently mobilized Russian personnel who have received no refresher training, who turn up and do stupid shit. Like leave all their ammunition in the open, don't observe communication security, or just drive around in a combat zone and end up getting ambushed because they don't understand even the basics. And so my question here is, will the Russians be able to get this sorted out? Because training manpower before you deploy it, even if the training is relatively minimal, even if it's just four or five weeks, the sort of stuff the British were originally providing to the Ukrainians, it can make all the difference in how efficiently you can use your manpower. But if they keep going the way they're going, the military impact of any given number of people being mobilized is going to be far lower. Of course, the obvious trade-off is it's hard to solve a training problem unless you're willing to pull experienced people back from Ukraine. And right now, heck, even during the winter, that might be a recipe for a disaster. My second question is what is the mobilization and staying power of Russian mobilized personnel going to be? This is the hardest item to compare and contrast with the Ukrainian mobilization experience. Because history, including the opening stages of this current war, show us that it is possible for relatively undertrained light infantry units to achieve great things. Ukrainian TDF units in the early stage of this war performed miracles holding static positions or staging ambushes despite a relatively low skill level. And during the Korean War, lightly equipped Chinese troops using smart tactics and being very well motivated proved capable of overcoming United Nations positions that had far greater firepower than they did. But in both cases, that meant having formations of light infantry that what they lacked in firepower they made up for in motivation. The Chinese willingness to absorb casualties and press against defending machine guns and artillery. The Ukrainian willingness to join units after heavy casualties, to go out and take on the Russian army, to sit in trenches under artillery bombardment for days or even weeks without the ability to respond. If the Russian conscripts fight like their Ukrainian equivalents, then they're going to have military utility. They can be used to hold the line. But if, like recently during the Kharkiv counteroffensive, mobilized personnel buckle as soon as the Ukrainians launch a concerted push, well, then they can become a gap in a line and become a threat to every other unit in a position, to the point where you would almost prefer not to have had the unit or the personnel at all. Now, of course, you might be able to offset this to some degree by using these personnel in rear area support services, have them drive trucks, for example. But that's not where the need is greatest. That's not where Russia needs the numbers. Russia needs them on the infantry line. And so I expect we'll all desperately be seeking new data to see how these new conscripts perform once they arrive in Ukraine, and also to determine whether they're being used in their own units or whether they try and reinforce depleted existing units with new conscripts and what that means for the combat power of those formations.
Which leads into the third question. How will these conscripts be used? Because from an efficiency perspective, if you value the lives of these individuals and you wanted to get the most effective soldiers and military utility out of them as possible, well then the approach would be fairly obvious. You'd have to slowly rebuild the Russian mobilization system. You'd have to train units properly. That meant not just basic infantrymen, but NCOs, officers, and you'd have to weld them into functional capable units. You'd take the time to train, for example, tank crews that didn't just know how to drive and shoot, but also how to maintain and repair their vehicle, how to work with other vehicles, and how to work as part of a combined arms offensive. But that's a hard, slow process, and the defenders of Liman or Kherson are probably not going to still be in position in seven months' time once you've got something to show for your efforts. And so I suspect in some cases Russia will make the decision to send mobilised personnel forward before they have been properly trained or equipped. Cases like the example given on the slide there on the bottom right where a 45-year-old was conscripted, mobilised, and sent to defend her son after only one day of training. In terms of the harsh calculus of war that measures everything as a series of inputs, this is the short-term solution, where you gain some combat power now in exchange for burning your manpower assets far more quickly. Sending underprepared men to hold a line is a recipe for higher casualties, as we'll talk about in a moment. And so my unanswered question here is how much space will Russia give its mobilised personnel to sort themselves out? Will it give the system six, seven, eight months to rebuild itself from scratch, to establish new training centres and to build new units out of mobilised personnel? Or will it send them all to the front in order to try and bolster the line, squandering some of its manpower assets but getting a sugar hit of combat power right now? So far it seems that Russia is mostly choosing the latter course that mobilised personnel are going to establish unit training bases. For example, we've got photos of personnel at some of the bases belonging to 1st Guards Tank Army, and from there on to Kherson or the fighting in Kharkiv. If that's the case, then 100, 200, 300,000 new mobilised personnel would be a very significant increase for the number of Russian troops on those fronts. Maybe the Russians reason that these troops, much as the Ukrainian TDF before them, may not be capable of complex offensive operations, but with the right grit, determination, some basic kit and equipment, they're capable of sitting in a trench and holding a line, which right now is most of what the Russians are doing in places like Kherson. Maybe their arrival will take some pressure off elite units like the Vedeve that have been fighting in Kherson for ages, or allow more experienced full-time personnel to rotate back for their first proper break in seven months of fighting. Which is why I come back again to the question of motivation, because even if the Russian mobilization system can generate 300,000 new recruits, can give them equipment, can form them to units, transport them to the front, and get them into the battle space, if they're not willing to stand and fight, to do their job under fire, if they're not willing to avoid undermining the morale of existing units, well then they're not going to deliver the same value or combat power as Ukrainian reservists did in the early stages of the war, and the Russian arithmetic might not work. And I'm making these frequent comparisons to the Ukrainians for a reason, because when a lot of people attack the Russian mobilization system and talk about the problems it's facing, they forget one very critical thing. And that is that at the early stage of this war, the Ukrainian mobilization system had many of these same issues. In fact, it had many of them far worse than the Russians currently have it. The territorial defense forces provided a framework for absorbing some volunteers, but the Ukrainian military simply wasn't configured to absorb hundreds of thousands of new volunteers and move over to a state of general mobilization, and then to train them, and then to equip them. There weren't enough guns to go around, there weren't enough officers to go around, there wasn't enough training infrastructure to get all these troops up to speed. And so, as I said in my video on Ukrainian mobilization, the opening months of Ukrainian mobilization were a shit show and elements of that shit show persist to this day, and yet the Ukrainians have largely made it work, because they've demonstrated that under certain conditions, relatively haphazard formations of undertrained individuals can make all the difference if they operate alongside more capable formations. Over the last seven months, Ukraine's worked out a lot of the kinks. They've enlarged the army to the point where they can now regularly outnumber the Russians in many operational areas. And if the Ukrainians can fix it, many people would reason the Russians can as well. Russia, after all, has some significant advantages. It has more total manpower available. It's got more domestic resources than Ukraine. It's got more weapon stockpiles. So the logic goes, if Ukraine could fix it, so should the Russians. But at the same time, I point out that Ukraine had advantages in that process as well. Ukraine had the ability to send its people overseas to train in Poland or Britain or Germany or France. 
It was able to resolve equipment shortages by simply getting its allies to send more weapons. We focus on HIMARS and artillery pieces. We don't focus on the tens of millions of rounds of small arms ammunition, the small arms, the body armour, the helmets, the communication kit, all the stuff that has gone into helping equip the average Ukrainian soldier. The equipment that helps explain why Ukrainian soldiers have gone from looking generally pretty haphazard at the start of the war to generally looking pretty well equipped now. And perhaps most importantly, Ukraine has had enthusiasm and time. Ukraine in the opening stages of the war, and even now, is drowning in volunteers. They have the personnel they need. And a unit with motivation, Western weaponry, and a little bit of training is a lot more effective than a unit with Western weapons, a little bit of training, and no motivation. Add the better part of half a year in order to work out the kinks in the system, get people trained, get things organised, and slowly work through the teething issues, and you can understand why Ukraine is where it is, and how much Russia has lost by delaying mobilisation to this point. And so if we're trying to estimate how effective Private Conscriptovich is going to be when he finally enters the fray in Ukraine, I don't think comparing him to Ukrainian TDF or reserve units is fair or accurate. I think we've got a better proxy of how they're likely to perform. Because whatever the Kremlin says, conscripts have been fighting on the Russian side of this war since the beginning. It's just they haven't been drawn from Moscow and St. Petersburg. They've come from Donetsk and Lugansk. Conscripts from the soon-to-be-annexed Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics have been fighting in the Donbass, were fighting at Mariupol, are fighting at Kherson, and of course were famously present at Balaklia from the No Panic incident. And we've talked about the performance of these mobilised units before. And to avoid any stain of bias, I'm going to rely on commentary from commanders and figures who've been involved in leading these sort of units or who are on the Russian side, people like Khodorkovsky. He observed that mobilised personnel were not suitable for assault actions, even after several months of fighting. That they were used primarily to hold sections of the line, while more experienced and full-time and contract troops did the assaulting. He also noted, however, that they took very high casualties when they were attacked or when they did go on the attack. He said that they were capable of learning, but it was a very Darwinian process, that troops arrived at the units on the assumption that they'll either learn how to be good soldiers or they'll die. A system of training and development that I really hope never catches on in government or among big corporates. Strelkov, meanwhile, has consistently noted the very high casualty rates associated with the usage of these kind of units especially when they are not properly equipped and married with tanks and artillery. At a zoomed out level, we've seen these units be used extensively, sometimes successfully, yes, with their usage sometimes being very cynical, like deliberately drawing Ukrainian fire in order to reveal positions. But especially in recent months, we've also seen some high profile failures by these units. Arguments, for example, and accusations on the Russian side that mobilized personnel in Kherson broke and ran during the initial stages of the Ukrainian offensive, leaving the VDV to fight by themselves. Or the famous incident in Balaklia, where the mobilized personnel there failed to resist the Ukrainians, arguably sparking the breakthrough that gave us the Kharkiv counteroffensive. While an imperfect proxy to be sure, I'd argue this is probably a better estimation of how Russian conscript units will perform as compared to a direct comparison to Ukrainian equivalents. It will generate units that are not like-for-like -like comparable with full-time professional soldiers. A unit of newly mobilised is not the same as a unit of Vedeve or a unit of guards tankers. But it may nonetheless have some defensive utility if properly supported. Although that cold calculus and statement should come with a giant asterisk. And so I'll close with a quote from a Russian commander and commentator here. If this approach is maintained, the shortage, he says, will be constant. No matter how many people you mobilise, Russia will be overwhelmed with a wave of funeral notices in the absence of the desired result, which will lead to a serious crisis. And so I'd suggest that the most realistic picture of what to expect from Russian mobilisation sits somewhere in the middle. I think it's really wrong and misguided to write off Russian mobilisation potential. This is a country which, all else being equal, has more manpower potential and much more military industrial potential than its Ukrainian opponent. It might use this process to do relatively easy things, like get more manpower for support roles. It may be able to fix some of its training issues. It may be able to fix some of the equipment shortages. If given appropriate time and breathing room, and if morale holds, Russia might be able to use mobilisation to reverse the manpower trend. Remember, mobilisation has been trending the overall manpower situation in Ukraine's favour for some time. 
Mobilization offers Russia its last best chance of reversing that trend. And just because these troops will be conscripts doesn't mean they lack any potential to be effective. History is full of examples of effective conscript armies, just as it is full of armies that learn and adapt to trying circumstances. Ultimately, how effective this process is probably depends not just on the Russians, but on the Ukrainians in the West. How much pressure can they put on the Russian front line in order to prevent them taking the time to rebuild their system and train their personnel? If Russia has to keep feeding troops into the front just to stabilise the situation as Ukraine gets more Western weapons and more training services from abroad and a continuous feed of intelligence, well then Russia's never going to have the space in order to overhaul itself and generate new combat effective units. Certainly not without fundamentally changing the economy over to a complete war footing and expanding mobilisation from a partial to a general affair. Which, by the way, is something I certainly wouldn't rule out. Because at the macro level, I think the pressure on Russia to move towards a more general or expanded mobilisation is only going to grow over time. You're going to have upward pressure on attrition and force requirements. Introducing undertrained or under-equipped personnel is going to drive up casualties. Those casualties need to be replaced. If the troops that are going in are not as effective or efficient as the troops they're replacing, which seems likely because you're using conscripts instead of professional soldiers, then you need more troops to have the same level of combat power. And of course, if Ukraine continues to get an inflow of Western weapons and training, well then you need more and more troops in order to match the Ukrainian buildup. But at the same time, you're going to see a downward pressure on the volunteer inflow. Now that the war looks to be long, costly, expensive, and now that you've got conscripts going, how many Russians are really going to be racing to volunteer? And for those who do volunteer, how intact is the training establishment going to be? How deep are the equipment reserves? How much ability does Russia have to replace those old contract units like with like? So as those old contract units fade away, wear down, attrit, lose their edge, Russia has to replace them with conscripts and reservists. And because those conscripts and reservists are less efficient, you guessed it, they need to use more personnel, which leads to greater levels of attrition. And so I predict that if you're going to see Russia using mass, numbers, bodies, to substitute for skill, training, and cutting-edge equipment, then you're going to see an army that regresses as it grows. Troops with truncated training programs, officers with less experience, and more and more equipment from the Soviet era as opposed to the most modern examples of what Russian military engineering can produce. You may well see a Russian army that, as it expands, develops the ability to time travel, steadily morphing back and back and back until it more and more resembles the forces of the late 20th century instead of the early 21st. What that will ultimately mean for battlefield outcomes in Ukraine is, of course, very hard to say. But I can make some observations. In this war, after its initial missteps and reverses, Russia fell back on the idea of a war of attrition. Ultimately, that war of attrition didn't favour them for a variety of reasons, the biggest two being that Ukraine decided to go to a general mobilisation that was generally supported by the population, and Western nations stepped up with money and arms to enable resupply. The halfway measures that Russia used couldn't keep up with its losses or with the force generation efforts that the Ukrainians were using, and so Ukraine won the force generation race. It obtained force superiority and seized the initiative, allowing it to go on the offensive at Kherson and at Kharkiv. Mobilisation, then, is Russia's last best option in order to give it the defensive mass it needs to try and reverse Ukrainian momentum. Whether that works remains to be seen, what seems to be guaranteed is it will lead to an increase in casualties as more men are introduced to the combat zone with relatively limited training. But it may well buy Russia time. And the gamble, the thinking may be, over time the West can be separated from Ukraine, that enthusiasm for supporting Ukraine can be broken, and as a result Russia can, through the act of mobilisation, outlast its opponent. Now given the statistics we have on Ukrainian popular opinion, and the fact that the Americans and Europeans are on the verge of voting for a series of additional support packages for Ukraine, I don't foresee that plan working. And as conscripts go back to Russia in body bags, I foresee there being a genuine danger of increased social discontent. But as always, ultimately only time will tell. In conclusion, Russia's decision to delay mobilisation until now hampered the impact that it's had. The cannibalisation of training units and the running down of equipment stockpiles means that Russia isn't going to get the same impact out of mobilisation now that it would have if it had begun in, say, April. 
I'd also note that there's very little reason to take Shoigu or Putin at their words when they talk about this being a partial mobilisation of a select group of people numbering no more than 300,000. The written orders supporting it don't include those sort of protections and provisions, and what we've seen out of mobilisation so far suggests a far wider net is being cast and far greater problems are emerging, problems that are being admitted even by the Russian propagandists and state figures themselves. In a number of cases, troops that are mobilised are getting terrible equipment, very little training, and they're not being sent to cushy or support roles, they're being sent to flashpoints like Kherson. Predicting how efficient these troops are going to be once they get there is very difficult. It depends on how Russia answers a number of key questions. But the evidence we have from how DPR and LPR conscripts have previously performed suggests that these units, unless they're given proper training, are probably going to have some military utility on the defence, but very little offensive power, be prone to high casualties, and ultimately have their military usefulness asterisked by questions over their morale and staying power. Contrary to some of the triumphalist narratives out there, I think Russian mobilisation has the potential to be extremely significant, but only if Russia is able to overcome some of the serious problems that it faces. And critically, only if Ukraine doesn't receive the resources it needs to keep up the pressure at the front. Because if fighting remains intense, then there will always be pressure on the Russian command to direct newly mobilised personnel to the front immediately. It would be wrong to underestimate the sort of impact that hundreds of thousands of new troops might have, but at the same time it would be equally unwise to turn a blind eye to the sort of challenges that Russia will face in terms of developing these new recruits into a combat effective force. Fresh Russian conscripts are going to have to fight potentially hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian veterans, in many cases Western equipped, and in many cases buoyed with confidence after their experience in the Kharkiv counteroffensive. In the war for forced generation, Ukraine has had a seven-month head start, as well as the advantage of a much deeper level of social mobilisation and military morale. And perhaps that's why Anton Garoshenko, an advisor to the Ministry of Internal Affairs in Ukraine, recently posted an alleged quote of Valery Zluzhny, quote, We have finished off the Russian professional army. Now it's time to finish the amateur one. Okay, channel update to close out. Firstly, a big thank you to Nicholas Moore and the Chieftain for appearing last week. I think it really made the difference in the quality of that episode. I do have some other guest contributors that I've lined up, but I'll announce them when it's time for their episodes to come up. Also, a very big thank you to my patrons who voted in the recent poll over which charities should be receiving support from the channel. I like to direct some of my sponsorship earnings towards uh, Ukrainian charities, and the vote this time selected the humanitarian stream of United24, which is the Ukrainian government's official charity for gathering humanitarian donations for Ukraine. So when my next ground news payment comes in, the entire sum will be going to that charity. And on the note of sponsors, thank you very much to Blinkist for becoming a returning sponsor. The link for that free trial and the special offer is down in the description. On the admin side, things have been pretty tight on my side, but I am working on some changes nonetheless. Most excitingly, I've had some submissions on a potential logo redesign. I know you all love the existing logo, but I will be throwing up some potential options for change for voting on for patrons in the near future. There will be the option to retain the current logo or to consider some of the modifications of it that have been put forward. I'm also considering bringing in someone to help me manage all the various people who have volunteered to help in various ways and to help with the production side of things. I'm not sure if that's going to be possible, but it is something I am looking at. In any case, I thank you for your continued support of this channel. I genuinely appreciate it. If you're interested in the gaming side of things, I'm playing a little bit of Terror Invicta in my very little spare time, so feel free to check that one out. Otherwise, I will see you all next week.